Welcome one and all to my tutorial on how to install Stable Diffusion on your Windows 10 PC. Stable Diffusion is an open source latent text to image diffusion model capable of generating nearly photorealistic images based on any text input. It's been trained on billions of publicly available captioned images from the internet and in very simple terms has processed billions of images and turned them into data points that it uses to create images based on the data from those pictures. An apple has a round part here, a stem there, and is red or green. A tree has leaves and branches. An oak tree has pointy leaves. A birch tree has a pale colored trunk. Things like that. So if you're interested in taking a deep dive and reading about how it really works, visit the link to the research paper in the description below. It's very in-depth and, well, it's a research paper, so it's a difficult read. But it really does go into detail on how exactly it works. It really basically takes data points it learned from these pictures and learns how to generate an image from scratch based on random noise that is generated using a seed, which is a random number. So the random noise that's generated uses the text you enter and the computer attempts to recreate the images that it studied using machine learning and attempts to recreate them based on this random noise. So it takes the random noise and refines it and refines it and refines it until it matches, you know, some of the attributes that it's learned that different items look like. What this means for you is that you will be able to generate images created by artificial intelligence on your Windows PC all day, every day, free of charge. No more using paid services like Dolly 2, Midjourney, Wonder, Pixels.ai, Starry AI, Wombo, Night Cafe, etc., etc. Those services are fine, and you're more than welcome to keep using them, but this will allow you to use something that's very similar on your own home PC for free as many times as you want over and over and over again. I should mention these require at this point, mostly require, an NVIDIA video card and recommended that it has at least 8 gigabytes of video memory, so VRAM. 10 or 12 is even better, but if you have an NVIDIA video card capable of running CUDA and it has at least 8 gigabytes of memory, you should be able to run this. So, first we want to install Python. Uh, we'll be using Python version 3.10.8. So as you can see, we're at the Python site here. We're going to go to Downloads for Windows. So now that we're here, uh, we're going to scroll down till we get to Python 3.10.8. Go here, and we'll go ahead and download the Windows installer 64-bit version, because I imagine you're running a 64-bit version of Windows. If you're not, you should be. I'm using Chrome. In, if you're using Chrome, the downloaded file will show up down here on the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. If you're using another browser, such as Edge, it may show up in the top right corner up here. It usually has an open link next to it. With Chrome, you just click on the file to execute it. That's why it says exe. It's an executable file. So you click that, it runs the installer. And now from here, you just click on the Install Now section button. Uh, but make sure you check the box that says Add Python to the Path. I'll explain the path quickly. It is a list of directories or folders for you young'uns, uh, where Windows will check for executable files when you type a command in the command prompt. Don't worry if that doesn't make any sense to you right now. I'll go over it a little bit later, just so you have a basic understanding and you have enough information to actually run this. So stay tuned, and we'll get right to that in just a moment. All right, so we see the setup was successful. You can click Close on this window. Now we have that programming language on our computer. And that is what this application is written with Python. So it's a programming language. You need it in order to run it on your PC. Next, we're going to install something called Git. There's a site called GitHub, which hosts a lot of source code and a lot of programs that people have made freely available, known as open source. Open source just means the source code is available, anyone can look at it and contribute to the project. So a lot of different people have contributed to most of these projects because they're open source and available to the public. So we'll go to the Git site through this link. All these links, by the way, are in the description below. So feel free to click more on the video and you'll see that all of these links are there. Uh, we do want the 64-bit for Windows setup installer file. So just click on that. You'll see it downloads very quickly and you can click it to run it. And I'll walk you through the steps for running this. Just click on next here. This is explaining the general public license. Go ahead and read through that. The default file location is fine. Click Next on this. The options to integrate it into Windows Explorer, the File Explorer, are not exactly necessary, and it will lead to more options when you right-click a file, so you can uncheck that box. Click Next on this page. Click Next. Vim <laughs> is not a great editor, so what we're going to do is use Notepad++. In my case, I have Notepad++ installed. 
I highly recommend using it. There's a link to the site here. It's a free text editor and it's great for editing text. If you don't want to use that, you can use Notepad, which is built into Windows. So if you don't feel like installing Notepad++, which I highly recommend, go ahead and just select Use Notepad. But in my case, I'm going to use Notepad++ because it is a far superior editor to the regular Windows Notepad. This is it here. Uh, it also has dark mode, uh, several nice features. So go ahead and click Next on this window. You can click Next on this screen. That is the option we'll need for this particular install. Click Next on this screen. You can click Next on this screen as well. You can click Next on this screen as well. The default option is fine for us. Click Next. I like to use uh, Windows default console window. It doesn't really make much difference in our environment, but uh, I recommend using this option. Click Next here. And the default option here is fine. We don't need a credential manager. Feel free to read up on it if you would like to use a credential manager with Git, but it's not necessary for this. Click Next. Click Next on here. And we don't need anything experimental. Click Install and it will install Git. And this allows us to pull files from the GitHub repository. In our initial installation, we'll just be downloading the zip file, but in the future, you may need this, and you'll definitely need this installed for this to work properly. We don't need to view the release notes of this, so we'll uncheck this box, and we don't need to launch it, so we'll go ahead and click Finish here. Now that that is installed, we're going to add Git to the System Environment Variables path. To do that, it's very simple. Right-click on your Start button. This will give you a list of management tools. Uh, you'll want to go to System, which will show you all kinds of information about your Windows system, including the version of Windows you're running, how much memory is on your computer, uh, etc., the name of your PC, etc., etc. So we're going to go ahead and click on Advanced System Settings to get to the Environment Variables, and click on the Environment Variables button here. This will show you different environment variables. I won't go into it in this video, but I'll probably cover some of these in another video. But basically, this is where Windows looks for files to execute when you type them on a command prompt. So I'm going to click on the path, importantly, under system variables. You must click on path under system variables, not under user variables. There are two different paths. So this is the path the system uses. Go ahead and click Edit on this, and you'll see that Git has already added this. I don't believe that was there before, so it looks like that was installed along with the installation. So go ahead and check if that is here. If it's not here, go ahead and click New and add the location, which is going to be C program files, just like it's typed there. So C program files with a space between program and files, backslash git, backslash command, cmd. Uh, that is what you would add here if this is not already existing. So just check and see if this is here. If it isn't, go ahead and add it. Click OK and click OK. Now you can close this and this. We've done that. Now the star of the show, the most important thing here. Next we'll go to Automatic 1111's page on GitHub. This is his code repository, so go ahead and click on that in the description below. This will also have a description of what the Stable Diffusion Web UI is. UI stands for User Interface, so it's a web-based user interface that will help you run Stable Diffusion. So it tells you all about many features and things. Won't go over it here right now. Uh, that's another video. I'm just showing you how to install it. So click on the code button on this web page and click download zip. That will download the zip file to your downloads folder and we're going to open that. You can just open it from here like this and it should bring up your built-in Windows zip. Uh, this is the folder containing all of the code so we're going to want to copy this to our C drive. So you can right click on it and click copy and then click on this PC, double click on your C drive, right click anywhere that's completely blank and click paste. Now, what that's doing is it's taking the folder from the zip file that's in our downloads folder and it put it in our C drive. That's what we want to do. That's what we've done here. Now that that step is done, we're going to actually run the, uh, the web UI. So what this will do is it will open up a command prompt window and, well, you'll see. So double click web UI dash user dot bat. Uh, it's a Windows batch file. Yours might not show the .bat because by default those are hidden. So if you want to see the file name extensions, which I highly recommend, just check this box. Click on View at the top of the menu and click File Name Extensions. That will show you all the extensions like the text file or the YAML file or the PNG for Portable Network Graphics file, uh, bat for batch file. Anyway, that's I'm getting way into the weeds here. Uh, let's go ahead and launch this. and. Windows will say, hey, look, this file could be potentially dangerous. Click on more information. 
There's uh, no reason to be scared of this. It's just warning you that these kind of files can do damage to your PC if you're downloading it from a location that you're not sure of that you don't trust. Click more information, click run anyway. It will let you run it anyway. It's just saying it could be potentially dangerous. It's not, but these kind of files could be. So do always be careful when downloading different files from a location on the internet you're not familiar with. So click run anyway. And what it's doing right now is it's creating a virtual environment, VENV, in the directory VENV, which is, stands for virtual environment, using Python. And that extension .exe stands for execute, uh, just like execute order 66. It's basically saying you can execute this file. So the file is executed. There are commands, instructions inside the file. So that's what that extension means. Uh, it's showing you that it's running Python version 3.10.8 that we installed earlier. It's installing something called Torch and Torch Vision. I'm gonna speed this up a bit. So just wait for it. It does take quite a while to do this step and it's basically installing a lot of the different things you need. Also, by the way, you will need a total of uh, about 20 gigabytes free for this, depending on the options you use and what all you want to install. Uh, but it'll take up roughly around 20 gigabytes of space. It's installing something called GIFPGAN, G-F-P-G-A-N, which is used for restoring faces that aren't very facial. So it's done the initial installs. It's saying right now that it can't run without a checkpoint, and it's saying please place a checkpoint file into the locations. So we're going to go ahead and press any key to continue. That'll close that command prompt, and we're going to go download the checkpoint of the models. For now, we're going to use 1.5. I will show you how to install 2.0 later, but 1.5 is the easiest to install right now. Link is in the description below, but we'll go ahead and go to the link here. And the site hugging face, I know <laughs> what it sounds like. I, I thought the same thing. Uh, you do have to create an account here for free. So go ahead and do that when it asks. In fact, I'll sign out so that you can see what it looks like. So the model card is here. You scroll down, you can read more about it. You can read more about the actual paper here, text encoder. You can read a lot about it. What you want to do is do feel free to read this page. This page has a lot of information on it. So we're going to go ahead and go from stable to fusion 1.5. Click on that. Uh, read the license. Make sure you read this license. It basically says don't use this for nefarious purposes. Be responsible. Be ethical when you're creating your images. So go ahead and sign up for this. What you'll do is you put in your email address, put in a password, click next, and it will walk you through creating an account. I already have an account, so I'm going to click log in. And then you can download the 1.5 EMA only. Basically uses less VRAM, which is your video RAM, video random access memory. And this is all you need to generate images. Uh, you can also download this larger 7.7 .7 gigabyte version of the checkpoint. And what this is, is basically a distillation of all of the information it learned from the billions of images that take up terabytes of space. And this is just the information it learned, none of the actual images themselves. So it's just a very compressed version of what it learned. And that's all you need for it to be able to generate images. So go ahead and click on this. It will start downloading and I will be back once this is finished. While this is downloading, we can go to the next step as well. We can go to the GFPGAN GitHub. And it's face restoration. It tells you all about it here. And this is something that's been being worked on for years. It's basically filling in gaps based on the information that it's learned. You know, take a bad looking picture and make it look better. It's not always 100% accurate, but it can make your randomly generated faces look a little better sometimes. So this is a nice thing to have. Uh, go ahead and download the 1.4 model, which is right here. Just click on that and it will also start downloading that. So when these are both done, they'll be in the downloads folder. So I'm going to go ahead and open the downloads folder. Usually it's in your quick access bar here. So you'll have a downloads link here. If you don't have it there, go to this PC and downloads should be up here in your folders list. If it's not there, you'll be able to find it. All right, this is completed. I like to sort by date modified. You can do whatever you prefer. So highlight the checkpoint version 1.5 that we downloaded from the Hugging Face site. And you can right click and click copy. You can press control C on your keyboard, whichever works better for you. Uh, go ahead and navigate in Windows File Explorer to your local disk, your C drive, where you've installed Stable Diffusion. So you have the Stable Diffusion Web UI Master right here. Go ahead and double click that and go to the Models folder. So go ahead and double click the Models folder and then double click Stable Diffusion. 
This is where you'll put the files for your stable diffusion model. And you can see it even has a file that says put stable diffusion checkpoints here in case you didn't know. Right click here and paste or another option is you can drag it from here to there so you can move it. They're pretty much the same option. I do recommend moving it because this does take up four gigabytes of space. So don't copy it from your downloads folder. Go ahead and either cut it and then paste it here, which will move it, or just drag it. Just drag it over and drag it. Uh, go back to your models folder. An easy way to go back to a folder you were in is you can click up to go back one level, or you can click on the name inside the address bar here. Go to the models folder. We're going to go to GFPGAN, GIFPGAN. So go to GIFPGAN folder and put your checkpoint for GIFPGAN, your models, whatever you want to call it. Drag that here, drop it. It will move it from your downloads folder into the GIFPGAN folder. Now you have models for your stable diffusion web UI to use. And before we go further, we're going to go ahead and add a couple of command line arguments. So go ahead and right click on the web UI and uh, open it in Notepad++. Or regular Windows Notepad. We're going to add a couple of command line arguments to the batch file that runs the web UI interface. So this is saying to download transformers, more than meets the eye. Uh, so this is saying to download the transformers module. And this is saying that it will automatically change the mathematical precision it's using based on how much memory you have available on your video card. So these options, these are just options it's using to run the program. There are many others. We'll go over some of those in another video. Subscribe so you don't miss out. But those are necessary for using the deforum animation extension that we'll be talking about later. Go ahead and close this. It'll ask if you'd like to save it. Yes, you would like to save it. All right. Now what we're going to do is, again, we're going to run the web UI user batch file to launch the web UI. So double click that. It'll tell you some of the same stuff. Now we've got installing transformers. X is for transformers. Xformers more than meets the Y. So after it's finished installing transformers it will install the requirements for the web ui which have pretty much already been installed now it's launching web ui with these particular arguments that's what we gave it in the other file it's telling it's running the latent diffusion model in eps prediction mode i'll talk more about that later it has about 859 million parameters it's loading the weights from the checkpoint that we've given it in the models slash stable diffusion folder this is all that's saying it's applying the transformers it's loaded zero textual inversion. We'll talk about that in another video. Embeddings. This is the address for the web browser that you'll need to use to launch your stable diffusion web UI. So at this point, we're pretty much done. We can run this thing now. So go ahead and highlight this. Just left click your mouse and drag it across. Right click it to copy and then open up a tab in your browser or open up a new instance of your browser, whichever, uh, and paste it in the address bar here. So you can either right click and select paste after you've highlighted this, make sure you highlight that so it'll paste over the top of it. Right click on it and click paste. So that's pasted the address for your stable diffusion web browser. So press enter on your keyboard or you could press control V to paste it there press enter. Here we are. So this is the interface for the web UI. Make sure you use this drop down and select your checkpoint. I believe since it's the only one it would use it anyway, but that's where you would select different checkpoints. Later on, you will be interested in that. Uh, this is where you would type your prompt. But before we get to that, let me show you some settings real quick. I know you're excited, you're eager to get started, but there's one setting I'd like you to change and we'll talk about all the settings in another video. But the setting you want to change, click on settings, there's a million settings here. Don't worry too much about them right now. Scroll about halfway down to where it says user interface on the right hand side. See how it's the show progress bar is checked? You want to raise this to a value other than zero. You want to raise it to maybe two or three. What this does is it shows you the image as it's being created it shows you the different steps it's taking from just staticky noise, just a noise, like a random noise. It shows you developing the picture. It shows the AI making different choices and developing the picture as it goes along. So this is very important because it's really fun to watch. And sometimes you'll see something it was doing and you might want to change the number of steps it's using to... Yeah, <laughs> we'll talk about that later. You know, you, you'll see what I mean. Apply these settings. Don't worry about any of the rest of them at this point. Let's go back to text to image. That's the main tab you'll generally be using. Um, here, let's go ahead and put in a prompt. We're going to say a cat in a factory. 
Okay, now we'll talk about the rest of these settings later, but let's go ahead and check it out. May take just a moment here, but you'll see something start happening. There it goes. Oh, look at that. So we generated your first image. Congratulations. Now, if you click on the image itself here, just click once on it, it'll show you a bigger version. And if you click on it again, it'll show you more of a full screen version. So it's okay. You can't really tell that this cat's in a factory. This fur looks okay. The whiskers look pretty good, a little blurry, but all of that can change and will change. Click the X to get out of the picture or just click anywhere outside of the image. You can see we have our cat here. One important thing to know is about the seeds. So the random noise that's generated to begin the picture, it's associated with a random number. So this random number is the seed. And if you have this seed value set to negative one, that means it'll generate a new random number every time you click generate. If you want to create the same exact picture again, you can reuse the seed. You could right click it and copy it and paste it into this field, but the developers figured it would be a feature people would want to use. So they just made this handy recycle seed button. So you can click the button and it will put the seed from selected picture into the seed field and you can click generate and make the exact same picture. What we'd like to do is see what effect the sampling steps have on this exact same picture. So let's go up to about 50 and see what changes on this picture. So we'll click generate and very quickly you'll notice it has uh, switched from that forward view to a different view. So you've got a different view already. Uh, the number of seeds changes a lot. AI makes different decisions as it's processing the random noise to come up with the image. So we'll go to another one here, 80 steps. You can see it's kind of back to the front facing. It's a little more black and white, pretty defined. Let's go up to, let's say 115. And you can see it looks like we're getting a little more factory in the background. Um, it's developing the cat a little bit better. So the cat looks pretty darn good at this point. The eyes a little wonky here and there. Um, but eyes are tough because eyes can have uh, light refracted at many different angles. They're reflective. So it's uh, difficult for it to understand what eyes are all about. And the same thing with fingers. You know, they can bend so many different ways and so many people have different... Yeah. So... You can see we put it all the way up to 150, and it's not getting any better. So sometimes higher steps don't mean a better picture. Uh, the eyes are even worse here. Uh, the factory is not there very well or anything like that. So uh, higher steps doesn't always mean a better picture. But in general, eh, somewhere around 115 is my sweet spot with steps. Uh, so let's see. Take a quick moment to explain the sizes here. By default, it generates an image of 512 pixels by 512 pixels, which is fairly small. If you want to print this out or something, it's not really big enough to do that with. Uh, there are ways to resize it. We won't be going over that right now. Uh, you might be tempted to raise this up as high as it'll go, but your video card probably doesn't have enough memory to handle that and it will crash. So if you go 2048 by 2048, generally you get some kind of an error down in this area saying called for too much memory and, but even if you go double the size, the pictures in the data set that it was trained on, in the 5 billion pictures that it was trained on, were all 512 by 512 pixels. So they limited it to that size because it took a lot less time and it was easier to train on a smaller image. So they made sure that all the images they trained on were only 512 by 512. So that's the natural size that it is used to rendering. The pictures are going to look best if you do them at 512 by 512 with this particular checkpoint. And you'll see what happens if we go double. So we went double on each side. And first of all, it takes a lot longer because it's doing a lot more processing. And it usually ends up, if you ask for one cat, it ends up with two, two or more cats because there are more than 512 pixels here. So it gets confused and it's generating an interesting image but it's probably not going to be what you were looking for or not exactly what you were asking for if you deviate from 512 by 512. There are a couple ways around that. There's the high res fix. There's a lot of things you can look into and I will be going over a lot of that in another video. But this is just getting you started just to understand that 512 by 512 is the best option to use to begin with. So just, you know, practice your prompting. Another thing I wanted to touch on is the, the words you use in your prompt matter a ton. Some of the additional words I like to use in my prompt are these. I'll paste them in the description below. But uh, sometimes this helps the AI generate something a little more highly detailed with sharp focus. Cinematic lighting is nice. There are different kinds of lighting you can use. I mean, there are, you know, you can use whatever wording for lighting you can think of. And whether or not the AI understands it and can process it properly is another thing. But try anything you can imagine. You know, just anything you can imagine, go ahead and put in here. Uh, these sometimes end up generating 
a little bit better picture. So we're keeping the same seed and we're going to go ahead and do a 512 by 512. And I'll remind you what the last one looked like here. But this one, um, with all those different modifiers, all those different tokens typed in, it does seem to look a little sharper, a little more sharp focus. Uh, it is black and white. That's where the negative prompt comes in. So this is things you don't want to see in the picture. So for example, if I put black and white, this can also end up changing the composition of the picture quite radically. So it can generate a completely different picture based on what you put in here. This just tells it, try not to put black and white in the picture. Turn it to include black and white. And it understands what black and white means. So now it's generating a similar cat, but without the black and white. So instead of being a black and white cat or a black and white picture of a cat, it is this orange cat instead, orange tabby with green eyes. You could also put, you know, you don't want the eyes to be green. You put green in here. Sometimes it'll work and create the same exact picture. Sometimes it'll create a wildly different picture. All right, so the eyes are a little bit more yellow or blue or hazel or, you know, what are they gonna stop on? <laughs> Who knows? That's a crapshoot. Not exactly. I mean, we are controlling it by using the same seed, so it looks a little sepia tone. I'm going to say I don't want sepia. All right. So now it's creating a picture that's a little less sepia tone. He looks a little more like he's in a factory. I think he's the foreman in the factory here. Um, but there you go. You have a cat that's a little more highly defined. Fun times. So instead of the cat in a factory, let's change his environment. A cat in a rainy cyberpunk city. This is the fun stuff. And really, you can try anything you can imagine. It may or may not be really good at drawing it, or rendering it, or, you know, it may not understand some of the language you use, but try different language. The fun of this is the possibilities are infinite. So here's a cat in a rainy cyberpunk city. Let's go ahead and change the seed back to random. So just click this die, and it changes it back to random number, which is negative one just means generate a random number next time. Uh, let's take out, just FYI, the pictures tend to be better when there's something, anything in the negative prompt. So let's say we don't want, you can say anything. I don't want an apple pie. <laughs> and obviously there probably wouldn't be an apple pie, but oh, look at this. This is turning out rather nice. Oh yeah, look at that. It's got the green eyes. He's got a little extra thing going on down here. I don't know what that's supposed to be. Okay, so here we have our cat in a cyberpunk, rainy cyberpunk city. Let's go ahead and randomly generate another one. And you can get real specific. You could say a cat sitting on the street or sitting on a table or whatever. So uh, it doesn't do well with multiple objects generally, multiple subjects, but we'll talk more about that later. Remember what the seed does. Keep that in mind that if you want to iterate the same picture, if you want to do something differently, if you want to check out how many steps make a difference in this picture, go ahead and uh, use the reuse the seed here. And then you can, let's say, dial the steps back to 80 steps and see what that will do, what the computer would do with 80 steps to work out this image rather than 115. So let's click generate. You'll see it starts off pretty much the same. Uh, it doesn't go as far. Sometimes it goes too far and puts like five arms on it or, you know, 13 ears. So sometimes you want to dial it back a little bit and have it do fewer steps. So just remember if you want to redo something with the same basic settings to reuse the same seed because that's the random noise that's generated that the computer uses in order to compose this image. These buttons that say save style and apply selected styles to current prompt. So let's say you have a specific style that's working well for you. You can go ahead and save it so you don't have to type it in each time. And what it will do is it'll save it and it'll be available from this dropdown. So let's say we like the Cat in the Cyberpunk City, highly detailed, sharp focus, cinematic lighting, high definition, post-processed like a photo, photorealistic, professional, and intricate. And we're gonna save that with the little disc icon and we can call it cat style. Now that is saved. So if we later on, we go, oh, well, we're gonna do a dog in the country. And generate that. All right, we've got our nice dog in the countryside. He's got a few too many ears, extra tail, two tails coming out. And you'll see that it uh, isn't so great with certain things sometimes. Uh, but we've got a dog in the country. Oh, I wonder. Like, it doesn't look very country-like. Mm -hmm, that'll make a big difference. We're still using the same seed. And you can see it's basically taking the same shape, except now he's in the country. Who's the good boy? He's the good boy out in the countryside. And uh, you're like, oh, well, I really wanted the cat, but I don't remember what I typed in. There are two important things to remember. 
You can use the style. So what you want to do is just load that. It'll just add it on to whatever's in there. So if you want to, you know, start from scratch like over here. The best way to use the styles is to save just the uh, descriptive keywords here. So you could save all these descriptors as a style and then you can just add it on to whatever else you're using. So let's let's redo what we just did, right? So I'm going to highlight this and delete it and I'm going to save this st as a style. I'm going to call it uh, good keywords. Kiwa Krawers. Goose Krawers. All right, well, I'll put space there. Good keywords, right? So we're going to go back to our dog. Hey, dog. Country. So now if you have a prompt here and you wanted to add your style onto it, you would say, oh, this is the good keyword style. Let's go ahead and click the apply selected style. If you have it selected here, it will render with that style. But if you want to see it in your prompt, you can click this. And also, it also keeps your negative prompt. So we ended up duplicating that a couple times. Uh, get rid of the extra comma here. Now let's click generate and see what happens when we do a dog in the country, same seed, same information, but with all these different descriptive keywords. Oh my goodness. <laughs> That's a little disturbing. All right. Uh, it gave the dog a huge schlance. Not a great example. <laughs> Doggy schlong. <laughs> uh, is it going to understand schlong? <laughs> oh man. There you go. It did it. Did it. <laughs> oh my gosh. And it wasn't exactly a schlong. It was probably an extra leg or something. But <laughs> Oh, that's silly. Man, it worked. <laughs> but I don't want it to be black and white. And I gotta stop here sometime. I need to upload this thing. And this is just gonna make editing take so much longer. Okay. So it's not black and white. No doggy schlong. <laughs> here we go. There you go. You got a dog in the country. Perfect. Anyway, as I was saying, I do want to show you where these uh, images are being stored on your computer. By default, it saves each one every time you generate them. It is stored in your, if you could go to this PC, go to local disk C, go down to Stable Diffusion Web UI Master, double click, go into Outputs, double click that, and Text to Image Images is where it stores all of these images that you generate. So our dog in the country is here. If you have a previous image that you really liked or you wanted to experiment with, go ahead and uh, go to the PNG info. PNG stands for Portable Network Graphic. It's a type of graphic file. Um, and that's what this saves them as. Go ahead to that tab. And what you want to do is drag an image and drop it into this section here. It will tell you all the parameters that you use to generate this image. It'll tell you the prompt up here, the negative prompt here, how many steps you took, which sampler you used, the CFG scale, which seed was used, the size, and which checkpoint model you used. With all this information, you can send it to the text to image tab. So now it'll overwrite everything that's in here and you can generate that exact same image. So if you were like, oh, I've really wanted to do that image again, but I wanted to change something about it. I wanted it, uh, let's say you wanted to do 80 steps instead of uh, 115. Let's generate it again and see what it does differently. You can see it's pretty similar. It's doing a little different. It's, the eyes are a little wonkier. The eyes were much better at the higher steps. Uh, you could take it down as low as well, as low as you want to go, really. But this will just do 30 steps. Actually a little better. <laughs> so it all depends on how many steps and what decisions the AI ends up making with this. And here we have a cat on a high-rise building. All right, so that's it for today. I'm going to go ahead and let you go and have fun experimenting with this. I'm going to have plenty of other videos tell you how to better understand the prompting, how to iterate different versions, how to use Deforum to make animations. I have my animation for Christmas coming out real soon. Worked for probably about 10 hours on it this weekend, but most of my time is spent editing this, and I really have been meaning to get this out, so I'm going to stop here. Let's get this published, and thank you for joining me. I sincerely thank you for choosing to watch this channel. I know you have many choices when you come to YouTube, and I thank you for choosing mine. I sincerely thank you for watching this. Please subscribe if you're interested in seeing more of my videos. It really helps the channel, and, you know, like it also. It helps the algorithm, helps more people see my videos, and more people exposed to my channel. And I really appreciate it. Thank you. I hope you have a wonderful day and have fun creating.